welcome back to The Young Voter. Today we're going to discuss two items of news. The first one is about Tea Party candidates. Now, a lot of you know that this election se season, there are a lot of Tea Party candidates running. How many do you ask? Well, there are a total of 138 Tea Party candidates running this election season. All Republicans. About a third of those are in Senate races, and about, and the remaining are in House races. Now, what is, what is going on? Well, the thing is, a lot of these Tea Party candidates are not legitimate challenges to the Democrats they're facing. A lot of them are in very Democratic districts, and they're going to be wiped out. They're mostly going to represent a protest vote. But in 33 toss-up House races and 8 Senate races, Tea Party candidates have a significant chance of winning and significant enough of a chance that they might be forming a caucus uh, similar to the Blue Dog Democrat Coalition um, after the election is over, once they are sworn into the, um, the U.S. Congress. Now, most famous among Tea Party candidates probably recently is Christine O'Donnell, the, uh, the candidate for Delaware, but she's not necessarily likely to, um, to win a Senate seat. Uh, Who is more likely to win? Perhaps Ken Buck in Colorado. Um, Rand Paul in Kentucky, John Racy in West Virginia, Carly Fiorina in California, Joe Miller in Alaska, and Sharon Angle in Nevada. They are in very close races and could potentially win. Now, what would happen if they formed a caucus within the Republican Party? Now, again, they would be a small caucus. I mean, only about 30 members, but they could have the effect of drawing the Republican Party further to the right because they would be saying, well, we were elected, we defeated um, establishment Republicans in the primaries, and obviously the base of the party wants to support us and our policies. So what would they do exactly? Well, they would probably want to drastically cut spending, cut taxes. Okay, well those are pretty mainstream ideas. I mean, cutting federal spending drastically by reducing a lot of programs, that's perhaps more contentious. But cutting taxes is politically popular. That's understandable. Next, what would they do? They'd probably repeal health care reform, which is, strange as it may seem, health care reform is unpopular, but it's unpopular mostly because People don't think it went far enough. In fact, a recent poll thinks, um, says that 60% of the American public think health care reform didn't go far enough. Not that they want to repeal it because it went too far. So that might be politically dangerous for them unless they want to perhaps introduce a bill that would go further, which is unlikely because they think that the current system is socialism. So God knows what 60% of Americans want. I mean, that would just be... That would just be blatant Marxism. That would be dangerous. That would be, I mean, as Christine O'Donnell said in the debate in Delaware, that should sh send shivers up everyone's spines, right? Yeah, okay. Um, what else would they do? They'd probably repeal the financial regulation um, that was passed on the banks. That would be great. I mean, now we can start another recession by, um, by deregulating the banks, just like we did under George W. Bush. I mean, that's, that's great. And... I'm sure the American public will really support deregulating the financial industry so you can they can the banks can take risks with everyone's savings. I mean that that's very that's a very smart idea. Um, and probably and of course, the most popular of all, they would want to get rid of Medicare and Social Security in favor of private accounts. Private accounts that of course would be subject to the swings of the stock market. Well, you think about it and you tell me what you think. I mean, if that doesn't scare you into voting against Tea Party candidates, I don't know what will. I mean, Medicare and Social Security are things that are universally popular. I mean, everyone likes Medicare and Social Security. Maybe it's a nice talking point when you say, well, I want my Medicare. They, you know, they can, they can get rid of their Medicare, but I want my Medicare and I want my Social Security. Now, what's funny is that a lot of these Tea Party candidates denounce uh, health care, when in fact they're receiving coverage through the government. 
in fact, which is even more socialist in quotes, than what the health care reform currently passed. Um, Sharon Engel in Nevada is benefiting from her husband's government health care. So is she going to give that back? I mean, I guess she should if she wants to be ideologically pure. Joe Miller thinks that welfare benefits are unconstitutional. Then why did his wife draw unemployment? Why did he get farm subsidies? Aren't those supposed to be unconstitutional? Aren't those socialist? Who knows? Well, I mean, you should research into it yourself, right? You should look and see what these Tea Party candidates stand for. But by and large, they all fit under this umbrella. I mean, they're pretty radical right-wing um, politicians. Now, if you agree with that, be my guest. But don't just be angry at what has happened in Congress and just vote in protest. Because these people, when they take control, they will do the things that they say they will do. Because the Republican Party marches in lockstep. It's a top-down organization, so when the Democrats can't really do much in a majority, the Republicans can do a lot. And things will get passed that you will not like, that the American public will not like. They will take away your Medicare, especially the young voters. Your Social Security, you won't have it. You won't have Social Security when you grow up. Do you want that? Previous generations have benefited from this, and you cannot benefit because of these people. So go out and express your opinion. Now, if you support them, go out and vote for them. If you don't, go out and vote as well. But vote based on your interests. Don't be, vote based on anger. Don't vote out of anger. Vote because you've thought about it. Okay? Vote on your interests. Vote on the issues. All right, the second item of news deals with the wife of John Racy, the senatorial candidate. Uh, for the GOP, Tea Party backed, in West Virginia. Now, Elizabeth Racy can't vote in West Virginia because she's also a registered voter in Florida. In fact, she hasn't voted in West Virginia since 1998. And this has called into question whether John Racy is sufficiently tied to West Virginia, etc. Because, in fact, John Racy apparently lives half of his year in Palm Beach, Florida. And so does Elizabeth Racy. Both of their daughters attend a private school in Palm Beach, and John Racy golfs at the same country club as Rush Limbaugh, who recently endorsed him, saying that they were locker mates. They have lockers right next to each other. Oh, well, I'm sure that'll play well into the voters of West Virginia. I mean, you know, a multi-million dollar golf club that you're part of and you've spent half of your time at and the other half of the time you spend in West Virginia, if you do. But that's this is really not about the economics of the race, or at least the wealth of John Racy. The thing is, Joe Manchin took advantage of this even before it became a major story. He took advantage of it by publishing an ad, or at least running an ad on TV. And the ad said, quote, Racy's wife is registered to vote in Florida, so she can't even vote for him. Why should we? Now that's a good question. I mean, if John Racy is spending so much time in Florida, does he really know the situation in West Virginia? Does he really, is he really that true populist that he espouses to be when he's really a millionaire? Who spends half of his year golfing with Rush Limbaugh? Now, if you still think he's a populist based on his ideas, well, go right ahead and vote for him. But be aware that He's so detached from the state that his wife can't even vote in the state. His wife won't even vote for him. His children go out, of, go out of state to school. Okay, that's understandable. But he lives half of his year out of the state. I mean, how is he truly prepared to deal with the issues of West Virginians when he doesn't even reside in the state? That's a question that you have to answer when you vote. And if you vote for him, be aware that this man doesn't really know so much about West Virginia, at least. I mean, maybe he does, but he hasn't spent much time in West Virginia, so does he like West Virginia? Or is he just trying to run a race there? But again, that's your decision, and the campaigns have been sparring over this, and Manchin has been trying to take advantage of this and everything. I'm not trying to encourage anyone to vote one way or another, but these are the facts. So look at the facts and make a decision, because John Racy spends half of his year in Palm Beach, Florida, golfing with Rush Limbaugh, who is his locker mate and who endorsed him. 
So keep that in mind when you decide to vote for him. That he is certainly not the populist he espouses to be. He's a millionaire. Just like all the people funding the Republican campaigns this election season. All those secret donations, they're for millionaires and billionaires who want their taxes to remain low. So just keep that in your mind when you vote on November 2nd. Thank you again for watching The Young Voter.